Uh, welcome, Brad. Uh, let's uh, begin. And uh, uh, please uh, share your thoughts on the today's subject. Very well. Thank you, Jatin. Uh, so good morning, everyone. My name is Brad Hayes. I think you've seen me on here a few times, but as I was saying, I uh, I don't make it as often as I'd like to. Uh, I was very interested in uh, Randy Saad's presentation a couple of weeks ago, uh, talking about uh, uh, emissions and and uh, things at the municipal level, which I thought was very uh, a very relevant and important topic uh, to talk about. Uh, my background is as a geologist, and I have been working uh, for much of my career in uh, oil and gas. But for the last 15 years or so, uh, what we have found is that there's a great market and a lot of very interesting work to do in repurposing our subsurface skills, both geoscience and engineering, to other energy related topics. And so that's uh, such as uh, what we're engaged with right now. Uh, for uh, got three projects on the go, one being a geothermal evaluation, one being a um, carbon capture and storage, uh, and another uh, helping a junior exploration company in prospecting for lithium from saline brines in the subsurface. So all three of those, we're uh, using the same data sets, the same skills and so on that we use in oil and gas to do other things that are related to uh, the energy transition and providing alternative sources of, ed of energy and reduced emissions in the future. Uh, we're also keenly awaiting the outcome of um, uh, evaluation of two proposals we have into Natural Resources Canada or NRCAN, uh, which will be to assess the potential for uh, carbon dioxide storage in the subsurface, uh, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast. So. Uh, there's a lot of background there to think about uh, various energy issues. So I'm going to share my screen here, and I've got a few slides uh, uh, to talk about, or to address anyway. Here we go. Good. Okay. So, yeah, the question being... Uh, We've seen a lot lately uh, about, I think most lately, about energy security. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bit about that. And of course, we've been talking for a number of years now about net zero emissions in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions with the hope of reducing uh, anthropogenic effects on climate. So the question I want to ask is, what is the right goal for 2050? Do we have to choose one or the other, energy security or net zero, or can we have both? So... I think the things I'm going to lay out for you briefly here, um, there's not any big uh, uh, new data or anything like that, but it's a bit more of, of a different way to look at things. And I think this is a great forum for that discussion. So there we go. So very obviously we use energy in everything we do. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking about all forms of energy. So talking about growing food, building homes, manufacturing things, transportation, uh, basically, just about everything we do uh, in a modern life requires energy, and it's not much of a, a jump from there to say that uh, energy is life, or at least energy is essential to uh, any kind of modern lifestyle. You may have seen a graph something like this in the past, and I'm not, I, I think Randy may have shown something like this as well, and I think it's very interesting to look at it. So it is the uh, consumption of energy by various types from where I would call the beginning of the energy transition over here in the early 1800s through to today. So really, the energy transition of the 21st century is a continuation of, of uh, energy transition that was going on for 200 years before. So just to dig into that a little bit, back in 1800, uh, all of the energy that humanity consumed was traditional biomass. In other words, burning wood, burning other combustibles such as animal dung and so on to, uh, to cook, to heat, to light. Uh, and um, you know that was, uh, that was it for the close to 1 billion people on the earth at that time. Coal came on stream and, and began developing its own applications in the mid 1800s. So by the time we got to 1900, 
we were still burning about as much wood and, and other things like that but we're also getting as much energy from coal. So it was kind of a 50-50 split. Now there weren't twice as many people, but there were many more applications such as steam locomotives, um, uh, uh, steam engines and other industrial powered uh, coal fired uh, energy. So there was a lot more things going on where that uh, became part of, of the modern life at the time with the availability of coal to add into the energy mix we go forward through the 20th century here, we can see the other common energy suppliers that we're used to today coming in, uh, oil in the early 1900s, uh, gas somewhat later, uh, hydropower started to become significant about mid-century. And the feature that we see with all of these forms of energy is a continued growth through time. In the late 1900s, nuclear became more important up till around 2000 when its growth slowed and kind of plateaued. And then we see, of course, in the late 20th century and the early 2000s, the exponential growth from a very small beginning of other renewables, particularly wind, solar, and uh, we're seeing more from geothermal and things like that today. So what I want to point out in this graph is that we, in, in terms of the energy transition over 220 years, we've seen continued growth of just about every type of energy. In fact, if you look at traditional biomass, which again, burning wood, uh, I think which would include wood pellets and so on now, we're actually getting more energy from that than we did back in 1800 when it was the only uh, form of energy around. Of course, there's 8 billion people in the world today compared to far fewer back in 1800. But nevertheless, the addition of these new forms of energy has actually not reduced traditional biomass. And similarly, with the growth of renewables in the 21st century, we're not seeing uh, any reduction in the amount of uh, of energy provided by particularly gas and oil. We've certainly leveled off the growth curve on coal, although if this graph uh, was the current one that went out to this year, you, uh, you'd see coal and oil and gas all popping up more to, to uh, levels above their previous highs. So the, the point I wanna make there is that the transition of en energy forms we're talking about is really energy addition. Nothing's been replaced. Nothing's been substituted. What we've done is to continue to bring on new forms of energy supply, uh, but our, the new applications that we use them for are increasing populations and the exposure of more and more people around the world to a modern lifestyle has basically led to all of these forms of energy contributing to the mix. But we haven't brought on anything that's basically replaced anything else on an aggregate basis. Probably the, the biggest replacement that I could point to would be the replacement of significant coal-fired electrical generation uh, by natural gas uh, related to hydraulic fracturing and the introduction of pretty cheap gas, particularly in North America. So that's, that's the background uh, of what we're looking at. I wanna put that in the perspective of some a report that I'm sure most of you have seen, the Sustainable Development Goals Report from the United Nations, uh, which was started up in the, in the 20 teens and, and is updated each year. But the fundamental thing there is that they have 17 sustainable development goals that they feel are required for people around the world to live a modern and decent lifestyle. And of course, those things include, uh, those 17 goals include uh, water, food, uh, fr uh, free political systems, the opportunities for education. Uh, number seven, uh, and I don't know how the numbering scheme goes, but it's, it's in there, uh, is access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. So it's recognized as one of 17 sustainable development goals. But I think when we think, look back at, at what I've just talked about is we actually have to have sustainable development goal number seven. We need energy security if we're going to achieve any or all of the other SDGs. You know, for example, we have uh, most people in North America have uh, access to uh, reasonable water supplies and educational systems and things like that, uh, where we have, because we do have energy security. 
in many parts of the world where they don't have adequate energy, uh, they aren't able to put together the uh, uh, basically the, the equipment and the and the energy expenditures to uh, clean their water or to put together good educational systems and things like that. Now, of course, uh, we all know that global carbon dioxide emissions, the main greenhouse gas that we have some control over, have been growing steadily uh, as we uh, bring on more and more uh, different systems um, and different energy sources. Of course, uh, uh, combustion of fossil fuels is the primary reason for the growth of CO2 emissions. And we can see that uh, it's at 2019 here, we're, we're up a little bit higher. So we're closing on 40 gigatons per year, 40 billion tons of CO2 emitted through uh, humanity's activities and growing very, very steadily, interrupted only uh, by basically major economic downturns such as we saw in 20, 2009. Uh, if this went another year or two, you would have seen a flattening off or a bit of a dip after COVID, but we're going back up again. So, uh, and in fact, of course, there is a UN Sustainable Development Goal related to emissions, uh, which is number 13, to take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. And uh, this is how it's presented in their report as a code red warning. Uh, so I, I've just snipped this right out. So this, this is the way it's presented. So it's obviously a very, very high priority amongst the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Let me switch away from that or, or build on that a little bit now uh, to talk about energy security versus reducing emissions. So here are some quotes from a report by Dr. Mon Monica Gatcher in the Positive Energy Group and the Institute for Science, Society and Policy at the University of Ottawa. She collaborated with Nick Nanus, a, uh, a well-known pollster in Canada, and, and came up with these statements as a result of their research basically saying that when you talk to people uh, in, uh, talk to Canadians across the country and ask them about their priorities uh, personally, uh, not, not in the abstract, but their personal priorities is that many people are concerned about climate and therefore are concerned about emissions, but in their individual personal lives, energy reliability and affordability are paramount. And I would suggest that those statements are very representative of what's actually happening in the world today. For example, we all know the stories from uh, places like Germany where uh, they have, uh, they have in, endangered, their energy security has become endangered through a number of factors, primarily uh, set off by the uh, Russian uh, cutting off of Russian gas supplies that kind of threw them into a crisis. Uh, they looked around and decided that they would have to start burning a lot more coal in order to achieve energy security. So despite having very uh, strict and well enunciated emissions goals in Germany, when it came down to the choice between energy security and their emissions, their short term solution was to uh, was to take action to build their energy security. And I think that's that's uh, consistent with this, these findings by Gattinger and Nanos. The International Energy Agency has, uh, has taken the approach that, uh, and I think it's very representative of approaches from many people. Uh, they put out this report in 2021. Uh, they call a roadmap for the global energy sector. Uh, and uh, the big title net zero by 2050. So the thesis here is, and this report was uh, updated very recently, uh, but I think it, you know, the, the thrust of it hasn't really changed. The thesis is that by uh, designing uh, schemes and milestones to uh, reduce carbon dioxide emissions, that we can go from uh, about 35 gigatons of CO2 emissions in 2020 and reduce the total emission count over to near zero in 2050. And along the way, they've uh, posted a number 
of, uh, of selected milestones. Now, this is a long report. There's a lot of detail behind it, but this is a nice highlight in terms of showing things like, for example, uh, by uh, 2030, 60% of global car sales are electric. Um, uh, 2035, overall net zero emissions of electricity in advanced economies, and so on and so forth. And you can, you can read all of those. Uh, there's also down kind of below the line here, uh, negative, uh, negative emissions technologies, basically storage, uh, carbon capture and storage, uh, and uh, and and building uh, low carbon hydrogen to replace some of our uh, fossil fuel consumption. So there's a bunch of different milestones identified that are proposed as a roadmap to take the energy sector from high emissions to low emissions over the next uh, 27 years. But my question is: This is is this really a roadmap? Again, looking at the individual milestones here. I think the conclusion that I would draw after doing quite a lot of study on this is, no, it isn't. It's not a roadmap. Uh, and to be very blunt about it, it's a, it's a collection of aspirations. It's a number of goals that have been set out to, uh, to, to be seen as necessary uh, to reach, uh, reach net zero. And the IEA did point out that this is just one visualization of the way you might get to net zero. It's not the only way. But the, the milestones that they list uh, lack, uh, if you read through the report, basically any cost-benefit analyses as to whether or not they are worthwhile things to do. Uh, they don't identify pathways to actually accomplish them. And this is where I come back to Randy's talk from a few weeks ago in dealing with projects at an individual level that will actually get us to where we want to go if we're going to have a uh, much uh, improved uh, say net zero electrical generation that means we need to build a lot of projects that have net zero uh, net zero emissions in order to get there and so it you know it's one thing to talk about goals but to actually talk about the pathways and execute the pathways to get there that's a bit of a different thing uh, something I've been involved with a lot, supply chains to build uh, the alternative technologies. Uh, we know that we need a lot more things like copper, nickel, uh, rare earth elements, uh, lithium in particular, which is something I've been very involved with. And you, when you get involved in these, um, these supply chains, you realize that given, uh, practically speaking, the amount of time it takes to develop new supplies and the fact that we're looking at you know, multiples of today's supplies of uh, elements like lithium, realize that we're not, we don't have the capacity to meet many of those, those demands on our mineral, uh, you know, our critical minerals to uh, actually build the stuff that we're talking about. There are still a lot of technologies that need to be developed and it takes a long time to develop technologies. And again, I, I don't want to take too much more time, but for, I, I know for example, uh, with lithium extraction, there's a great deal of technological chemical engineering development to actually do it in an environmentally uh, uh, respectful way. Uh, let's put it that way. Uh, of lithium extraction is a bit of an ugly process for the environment. And if we want to extract a lot more lithium, there's a lot of technology to be developed. And finally, the roadmap that the IEA lay, lays out does not even, doesn't consider the amount of energy uh, produced. In other words, they haven't actually looked at, well, can we supply humanity with the energy that we will be demanding uh, by addressing these emissions goals? So I would argue again, that the IEA approach is an interesting one, but it's not a roadmap for energy for a number of reasons. So let me finish off with what should our energy plans and goals be? I think the top priority should be that we have to provide adequate, affordable, and reliable, uh, readily available energy for everyone across the globe. We certainly don't have that today. There are uh, up upwards of 3 billion people, for example, that don't have adequate electricity to lead any kind of modern lifestyle such as having appliances uh, or even, even lighting through the night and things like that. So that is a goal 
uh, that's sustainable development goal number seven. And I think it is the one that we need to tackle as the top priority. And I believe it can be achieved because every single human being across the globe wants adequate, affordable energy. Those of us that live in, in well-off nations that have had energy security for decades uh, sometimes don't even realize that we've got it and we kind of take it for granted. I know a lot of people I talk to do. And it's not until you run into situations where you don't have energy security, such as during a blackout or doing some uh, natural disaster where energy supplies are cut off, that you realize very quickly how reliant you are upon uh, available energy. And that goes back to the example I mentioned before. In Germany, for example, they went from good energy security to all of a sudden uh, energy insecurity. And they scrambled really hard to right that situation so that they continue to move on. We do have a lot of alternatives for creating energy, in, uh, including fossil fuels, including uh, many of the alternatives that are being developed, uh, and many of them are very good. And we can build region by region using the best available local resources. So we see, for example, in Canada that has a relatively low emissions electrical grid that is largely because there is such abundant uh, hydroelectricity in British Columbia, Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec primarily, uh, and also because of Ontario's uh, heavy, reliance, heavy reliance upon low emissions nuclear. But in other parts of the country, such as Alberta, Saskatchewan, Nova Scotia, uh, as three examples, we don't have uh, abundant hydropower, certainly not enough to carry us. We haven't yet developed nuclear energy. We should be. Uh, so we are reliant upon what we've got in our region, which is basically abundant uh, fossil fuel resources to supply our electricity. And of course, I'm just talking electricity, there, not all the energy that we consume. Other places in the country, we're still uh, using a lot of fossil fuel energy for transportation manufacturing. That doesn't mean we ignore the environment. We certainly don't ignore emissions. There, there are sound policies being developed. They're going, there's going to be some more discussed at the COP28 meeting beginning today uh, to minimize environmental impacts, but the, uh, including minimizing emissions. Uh, I, I get a little worried sometimes with the focus on emissions that sometimes we don't we forget about some of the other environmental impacts, such as water resources, uh, impacts on the land, uh, and things like that, that, are, uh, that sometimes play second fiddle to emissions. We need the sound policy within the framework of adequate energy supply. And I'd conclude by saying that prosperous societies that have adequate energy can actually focus on improving the environment. Other societies where people people's top concern day to day is enough energy to survive, uh, they don't have the luxury of worrying about the environment. A sad, sad, but true. So that's, uh, that's my little presentation for today. I would love to hear uh, any discussion there is. Thank you, Brad.